as as indeed uh, we haven't had the chance to meet each other because we're not uh, all in the institute in Amsterdam. I will just say a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm speaking to you from France, which is where I live and have lived for the last uh, 40 years and where so therefore where I have been a, a member, first of all, of the uh, French section, the LCR, and then of the uh, NPA. Uh, but I came here uh, in nine, at the beginning of 1982 uh, from the British section. So that's why I'm speaking to you in English, because uh, uh, Britain is where I grew up. Um, and I came originally to be uh, a full-timer uh, for the international, on international viewpoint, and um, I am still involved in, in international in international viewpoint. Um, so I was a student and feminist activist, therefore, in the early 1970s, and uh, given the period, rapidly became convinced of the need to be in a political organization uh, and a re revolutionary internationalist one, given that we're talking about the period of uh, Chile and the counter-revolution and then the revolution in Portugal. So I've been a member of the Fourth International because it was the British section that I joined then. And I've also been a member of its Women's Commission for almost uh, as long. So, as I said, then I came to, to Paris. I was for over 25 years, I was not a full-timer and I was a teacher in the French school system, um, or remaining politically active uh, uh, and uh, with leadership responsibilities. And now I'm retired, so more or less gone back to being a full-timer. Uh, and another key responsibility that I had for many years was working with our youth comrades. Uh, organizing our international camp that uh, we held, we have held for every year apart from these last two pandemic years since uh, 1984, and we hope very much that we will be able to hold it in 2022. And uh, in terms of particular study that I've done, done it's been of women in political movements, particularly in the Irish nationalist movements or the Irish movements, in fact, in the early 20th century. So this is rather, in a, in a way, the conclusion of the school because it's talking directly about ourselves, the Fourth International, what we are, what we do, and what we aim to do. And so obviously, from that point of view, it is building on the reports that you have had over the last uh, 10 days. Unfortunately, I was only able to listen to the first one, but some of the others I am familiar with because I have heard them uh, notably last year when the school was also, uh, was also online. And of course, I, I've looked at the um, outlines and the reading materials that you've had. Um, obviously, uh, as you would have been told at the beginning, when we had in-person schools, they were longer, and we were able to have days, for example, on specific regions of the world, which made it easier or more obvious, perhaps, how, to, how we can illustrate the abstract con concepts and general trends that we talk about. Um, and how, how those are useful in understanding different regions of the world, but how also you can't just generalize and therefore think that everything is going to be the same everywhere. And therefore speaking at the school is also, is a two-way educational process. It's not just those of us who've had the occasion to, uh, to be able to, to learn from others and our experience in the international and bring you the result of that. It's also obviously part of the process of uh, us continuing to uh, enrich our own understanding and our own knowledge. So I'm going to uh, start with, as it were, the general or abstract need for an international 
and I will talk a little about the founding of the Fourth International, but this is not obviously going to be a history lesson. In the reading material, you will find more detailed um, explanations of, of, of the whole process uh, of, the, of the Fourth International, and I will, and therefore mainly, devote the second part to the Fourth International today, what our uh, strategic goal is, how we think we're going to get there, what our experiences are, and what our balance sheets are. So obviously you've already uh, heard Anna Cristina from Brazil, for example, on the question of imperialism uh, today and uh, other uh, reports that have also spoken about the international situation. So I don't really need to explain, but just, just put it in the context of what is world capitalism, its class nature, the imperialist and oppressive nature of the global system, and that this, of course, is, uh, is the context in which we're working, and one that for the last two years has been a very specific context because it has been that created by the pandemic. And it has uh, also been that obviously of the climate catastrophe. And so not only the workings of imperialism uh, itself as, as a developed stage of capitalism, and the economic and trade exchanges, but in particular, the, uh, for example, the, the rapid spread of the of the of COVID nineteen and its different uh, variants around the world, and also uh, uh, underline in what way. Uh, our world is very much globalized and how we share uh, the same concerns. Uh, for example, the pandemic brought to the fore the essential, uh, the role of essential workers who are very often uh, women workers, who are very often uh, workers from uh, other marginalized minority, ethnic and other uh, communities. All the government's inability to uh, deal with uh, the pandemic and to uh, find ways of protecting their populations uh, against it, the the, because of the inadequacy of the health services, uh, because of because of the cuts, because of the drives to austerity in the, in the, in the neo neoliberal neoliberal period, and also the way in which the pandemic has been used. Uh, to uh, enable very authoritarian responses. Um, we, obviously, the whole question of uh, health passes, vaccine passes, uh, obligatory uh, vaccination, uh, vaccine, vaccine mandates for certain sectors of workers is a whole discussion that is going on in uh, many, uh, many countries. But what we can agree on, first of all, is that uh, the problem is how to convince people and ha have, have governments have, uh, uh, for example, taken all the necessary measures to actually convince rather than uh, impose uh, people uh, to, to get vaccinated. And of, and of course, the question of the uh, lifting of the patents uh, on va vaccination, so that on vaccines, so that they would be uh, freely available throughout the world, and we've seen what the result of that is with the development of the latest variant in southern uh, in southern Africa, and in the same way, uh, the climate catastrophe, uh, which obviously was not helped at all by a COP twenty six. Uh, because the measures taken are totally inadequate, and I'm sure that uh, Mareka uh, went into that uh, in great detail, but they also show to what extent we are facing the same problems. Uh, we are facing the same problems of, of inadequate uh, response, and that, uh, it, again, 
like the pandemic, but uh, in, in general, like workings of the capitalist system, it's something that cannot be changed on a country by country basis. And therefore there is a real need for international movements, for international uh, demands, uh, international uh, solidarity and, uh, and collaboration. And uh, as I said, uh, what, we're, what we're seeing uh, growing on the other side, uh, despite the defeat of Trump, which was a little break in that, is that authoritarian uh, responses uh, are growing, the, 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 the feeding of conspiracy theories, the anti-vax and uh, all these things. Um, here in France, we have uh, the latest example with the with the with the um, uh, candid candidacy for the uh, next year's presidential elections with a guy, with Eric Zemmour, who is nothing but an extreme right wing, uh, in fact, media personality, but has suddenly come to the fore as a uh, and announced himself as a presidential candidate and is rivaling our traditional far right candidate because we have that as well uh, in the in the opinion polls. So it's true that it's a grim, um, it's a grim situation. This does not mean that there is no fight bit back and that there hasn't been any fight back. And in fact, from the beginning of the pandemic period, uh, we, we, we saw, for example, it's workers in essential sectors uh, fighting back over the questions of their conditions, both their health safety, and, uh, and the exploitation, obviously workers in the health sector, but also in distribution sectors uh, and, and so on. Uh, we've also, at the same time, uh, this situation has not, for example, driven the Bolsonaro out movement off the streets uh, in Brazil. Um, we've seen mass movements for democracy in Hong Kong, in, uh, in Myanmar, uh, we saw the uh, massive movement of the Indian farmers, which has indeed won uh, some, uh, uh, some success in forcing the government to withdraw the laws, uh, the, three, the three laws uh, against which they were fighting. And what is very clear and what we should all be, be very clear on is that each small victory somewhere is a victory for all of us. In the same way as a defeat, we all feel it, we should also feel uh, the victories. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is something that um, has been very clear in, uh, in, in Latin America with the fight uh, against uh, Bolsonaro, that when there has been uh, a small, um, a small victory, however small, in, in, another, in another Latin American country, it was something that helped to build up uh, the resistance to Bolsonaro. So the, the fight and the resistance of one makes us all stronger and defeat makes us weaker. And we can also look over the last couple of years at how the Black Lives Matter movement, starting in the United States, also spread and provoked uh, movements of the uh, undocumented in France against uh, the against the slavery heritage uh, in Britain, for example, uh, the way that uh, women's movements arising notably in Latin America also spread uh, spread massively, or the way that the Me Too movement uh, has spread around the world. Um, so. Despite the very unfavorable situation, and of course the catastrophe that is the climate and the ecological situation, uh, because we also remember the should should include uh, the fight against extractivism, notably by the indigenous peoples in the Americas. Um, the there is possibility of struggle. There are movements that are developing, that are, that are developing uh, new uh, proposals, new demands, new understandings of the ways in which uh, they 
and their environment uh, is being exploited and uh, destroyed uh, by, uh, by imperialism. And it was in a similarly catastrophic, obviously not exactly the same, uh, obviously um, period that the Fourth International was founded because uh, the Fourth International, of course, was uh, founded in the 1930s in the period of the rise of fascism uh, in Germany as well as in Italy. And what Trotsky pointed out was that the rise of fascism would inevitably lead to war. And it was from this point of view that he was so urgent for the founding of the of the fourth uh, of the fourth uh, of the fourth international, and um, uh, so we're in a similarly uh, a similarly urgent uh, situation, and therefore the question of international organisation. In a, in a general sense is, is really posed. Um, I, 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 I spoke about the resistance movements that, there, that there have been in the last few years. Of course, it's not new that there is international resistance. Uh, you may have heard of or remember, uh, for example, the rise of the global justice movement uh, through the 1990s and uh, the way in which uh, that uh, enabled, enabled us to uh, return to some discussions on strategy, on where movements uh, should be going after a period that had been um, very difficult. Uh, at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the of the 1990s and that therefore the question of what socialism in the 21st century was again posed there were hopes that some of those questions would be taken forward uh, for example, by the experience of the left governments, uh, what, what has been called the pink tide in Latin America, uh, but uh, there again, ebbs and flows, uh, the situation of uh, Venezuela has not been, or Bolivia has not just been uh, a, forward, uh, a forward march. So we are in a very chaotic situation uh, in, a, in a situation of big crisis where even the future of our planet uh, is posed, um, where there are forces on both sides, but for the moment we are not in, uh, despite the struggles, despite the mass movements we have seen, there's not been anything that has, uh, that has been a tipping point to change and to put uh, and to place us in a more favorable uh, situation. And as I said, the fourth international, in fact, this is the sort of situation in which it was founded and also perhaps uh, explains something about why the fourth international has never been as were the second and the third internationals a uh, an international with mass movements in key countries so to talk about the uh the fourth international uh, as such um it's the fourth so it came after three others uh so what happened to the uh three others uh, so the first international, which, as you know, was in the uh, period of Marx and Engels' uh, lifetime, uh, was, uh, was um, the, in fact, the, the original spark to why they 
they created it was a very simple question of worker solidarity across borders, was uh, exchanging information between workers so that workers would not be brought from one country to another to break strikes. And so this is a principle, obviously, of international organization and why it's important so that solidarity across borders can be built uh, on the side of uh, the working the working classes. Uh, but it was a very disparate organization of very many different types of organizations, more trade unionist, more political with different political orientations uh, and, uh, and so on, and came to uh, more or less uh, to a natural end. The second international obviously was um, Its, its main party was German Social Democracy, which was a truly mass party, uh, which was uh, a framework for the lives of, of, the, of a, the mass of the working class uh, in terms of political organization, in terms of trade union organization, uh, and so on. And I mean, obviously, all these internationals had their problems, but uh, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing a history lesson. But as we know, came to an end when in the First World War, uh, first of all, the German Social Democratic Party decided to support its own government in, uh, in the war. And uh, the Third International, of course, built on the success of the uh, revolution in Russia and the creation of the Soviet Union and was um, therefore destroyed by the Stalinist counter-revolution and therefore this was when the left opposition led by Trotsky and others uh, began to uh, organize uh, so from the late 1920s uh, into the 19 into the 1930s and I and as I say under the uh, urgency uh, from Trotsky's point of view of the rise of fascism and the coming and the coming world war so the um, it was it was a difficult process because therefore uh, they were minorities. They were a minority in the in the Russian Party. They were a minority in most of the communist parties around the world because, of course, by now there were uh, important and mass communist parties in in many countries around the world uh, following on from the prestige of the Russian Revolution and therefore the Trotskyists, the left opposition, were a minority and, uh, and also subject to severe repression uh, from, the, uh, from the Stalinist uh, majority, including uh, physical uh, liquidation. And um, so in the, in the road to building the uh, Fourth International, uh, there was, first of all, the attempt to build it more broadly than simply the left oppositionists coming out of the communist parties with other organizations that we may or may not uh, define as centrists, uh, as something that didn't um, uh, that didn't come to that didn't come to fruition uh, and other uh, and therefore within and also among the left oppositionists themselves feeling that they couldn't declare a new international with without having at least one or two real mass parties that really represented something in the working classes of, of key countries. And that's why during the 1930s, there were a series of different conferences, uh, an open letter for the Fourth International in 1936 and so on, until the actual conference in 1938, which did declare um, the, uh, which did declare the Fourth International. Uh, because as I said, uh, Trotsky, who of course himself was in ex exile in Mexico at this point, was very um, uh, insistent on the urgency uh, of uh, of doing this, and and this is this obviously this uh, foundation process of being a minority of having to 
a fight to establish uh, a certain place and a certain legitimacy is something that we can consider has had a, a, an effect on uh, uh, on the inter on the international. Also, in the sense it had to fight for, on the question of internal uh, democracy, uh, for example, and to, I mean. At, at that point, against being physically liquidated, never mind actually having their having their voices uh, having their voices heard. So, um, of course, the international was founded, and almost uh, immediately the war broke out, and of course created a very difficult situation, uh, a complex situation. It was not like the First World War. It was not simply an inter-imperialist war because it was also a war against fascism. It was also a war against uh, uh, occupation uh, and, uh, and so on. And of course, although uh, Trotsky started with unconditional support for the Soviet Union when there was the Soviet Hitler Pact, uh, that obviously made that more, more complicated. So it was, uh, it was a difficult uh, period. It was a difficult period politically, and it was obviously a very difficult period uh, practically, physically, um, for, the, uh, for the international. And also uh, certainly in the uh, European countries and where there was the mass resistance to German occupation, uh, Nazi occupation, uh, there was also, even in that context, uh, there was um, repression by the Stalinists against the Trotskyists with uh, including in the French resistance, Trotskyists being shot by Stalinists and, and so on. So it continued to be a very difficult position. So what main, maintained, obviously, the Trotskyists was a commitment to an internationalism against the socialism in one country, uh, orientation of um, Stalinism, and um, and a faith and a, and a political conviction uh, in the possibility, obviously, of the working class to fight consciously in its own interests, and that that would lead to a confrontation with capitalism. And that is the reasoning, that is the dynamic of the transitional program. Uh, it's not a, uh, people sometimes portray the transitional program as you look for kind of like the lowest common de denominator uh, demands and that, no, it's that, in, that demands that seem obvious and concrete uh, are actually very far reaching, uh, such as, for example, the sliding scale of wages to propose to workers that wages should go up automatically as prices go up is a very obvious, simple idea to grasp. But obviously, in fighting for that, you are actually fighting uh, the whole uh, dynamic of capitalism. Uh, to say that banks should be nationalized, similarly. And so this was what we call the transitional method uh, that uh, that as workers uh, that convincing workers of these basic demands which seem very obvious could lead the can can lead to a um, to an actual confrontation with um, with with capitalism and so it was on this basis of the uh, of this conviction of the need for internationalism, of the possibility of the working class, that the small forces of the Fourth International did continue uh, to struggle and to exist through this difficult period uh, of the uh, Second World War. And um, 
even in fact in the early 40s the, they happened they managed to have a, some sort of conference in Europe but there was actually the rebuilding obviously came after the war had ended with uh, what was at the time uh, a significant organization the SWP of the United States which having been in the United States had been less um, physically um, destroyed by uh by the war and also had people who because they were in the uh were able to travel because they were in the armed forces and and so on so there was a rebuilding uh of the fourth international uh after the second world war it was still a very difficult period because the communist party had come out of the war with a big uh, prestige uh, from the resistance. Uh, so in countries where there was a mass communist party, it was it was still difficult for the Trotskyists to uh, uh, to to establish themselves. So we had different uh, attempts in doing entryism in the French Communist Party or in the British Labour Party. Uh, the American SWP continued to build itself as a uh, as an independent organization. In Italy, uh, it was entryism in the in the Italian Communist Party as well. There were different uh, groups in Latin America, in Asia. Uh, there's obviously a lot of history that uh, I can't uh, go into all the details of. There are different things uh, that you can that you can read uh, that will go into this period. Um, the memoirs of Livio Maitan, which exist in English, French, and Italian, uh, histories of the international by Pierre Frank, uh, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. And it was it was because it was a difficult period. It was also a period of splits and people leaving. Um, so there were different strands, obviously, of Trotskyism uh, that developed around uh, Nahuel Moreno in. Uh, uh, in Latin America and also a Posadas uh, in, from in, in, in Britain uh, around personalities of Ted Grant or Jerry Healy. Uh, in France, there was Pierre Lambert. So, I mean, originally, obviously, everybody had been in the international, but different splits at different times uh, took them out, and there was a split 1953 that was overcome in 1963 and uh, led to the inter the fourth international of which we are the continuation and as it exists today and which is why uh, to to some people to older generations on the left we're known as the United Secretariat or USEC um, because that was the leadership body that was created at the time of the 1963 reunification. And one of the important um, uh, points of the, uh, uh, of the reunification in 1963 was the recognition of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, obviously, so the question of Cuba and the Cuban Revolution obviously has a general political importance uh, for the left. It also therefore has this particular significance uh, for us. Uh, obviously, uh, the Cuban Revolution was not uh, an isolated um, event in the sense that uh, in the post-war period, after the effects of the war, combined with the uh, effects, in fact, of the post-war boom, uh, industrial economic boom, uh, there was a general development of national liberation struggles uh, around the world, uh, but also generally of a radicalization, uh, a student and youth radicalization, of which I'll uh, talk about uh, more, and also a uh, radicalization including in the working classes. It was also a period of big workers' struggles. Um, as Ernest Mandel was fond of saying, in fact, workers going to struggle when they think they might be able to win something, and they're more likely to win something if there's, if, if there's an e economic 
boom if there's general prosperity because the employers will be in a will find it easier uh, in fact to uh, make some concessions to them so it, it was also a period of uh, of big struggles and therefore radicalization of workers so it was also uh, the, the 1960s the period of the start of the of what we call the second wave of the women's movement uh, a broad feminist uh, radicalization um, and so uh, the creation, therefore, of a, of a new context in which small revolutionary organizations uh, could begin to build themselves. And so uh, in, in a sense, it's really it, it, it's a key moment in the development of the Fourth International where it could seem or it did seem, or it was the case, depending on what your balance sheet is, that we actually managed to take uh, a step forward uh, compared to the very uh, minority uh, type of existence that uh, for many of our organizations had been the case uh, up until that time. So that must be just about it because I saw two minutes so it's the good point to, to end so that I come back with this new stage after the break.